Part 4, the imaging part of magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. Quick introduction to pique your curiosity. Previously in Part 3, we learned the detailed mechanics of how the magnetic resonance phenomenon occurs, and now we are finally ready to delve into the details of how to use this natural physical phenomenon while harnessing its properties to generate detailed three-dimensional images for medical or other scientific purposes. The interesting question for medical image acquisition is this. Let's say we want to see inside the human body. How do we look inside without actually physically cutting open the body or going out into the fourth spatial dimension? Well, in general, using the science of medical imaging techniques, we can indeed view the inside of the human body without actually cutting it open. And in this video, we will be talking specifically about magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. There are other modes of medical imaging, including CT, computed tomography, optical coherence tomography, OCT, and ultrasound, which accomplish the same goals of peering into the human body without actually cutting it open. And these are such in-depth subjects that they could be the focus of other separate videos, so they will not be discussed much in this video as it is not the focus, but it is worth mentioning to illustrate the breadth of this scientific field. Without further ado, let's jump right into the detailed story of how MRI images are formed. So what is an image? Let's just think about standard two-dimensional images for a second, like the ones that you take on your phone camera. Essentially, the camera lens receives light information from the external world and then converts it to a two-dimensional grid of pixels whose values represent intensity of color, as shown in the diagram. If somebody takes a selfie photo of one's face, obviously the light intensity values corresponding to a face gets recorded on the grid of pixels. But what if we wanted to see inside the skull and perhaps look at the brain? Well, we could take an x-ray which would show the shadows of the bones, but it doesn't give us the full picture of what's inside, because after all, the shadows of the bones are just two-dimensional projections of the three-dimensional structures. Though x-rays allow one to peer inside the human body, so to speak, with, without making any incisions and cutting open the body, it does not provide much information about three-dimensional structures, since it is ultimately just a two-dimensional representation of the shadows. So this is where we need to get creative with our imaging techniques and the fundamental question of the field and the heart of why the field of medical imaging engineering science is even interesting. So at the end of the day, we want to take measurements to fill up a three-dimensional box or grid of pixels or voxels, which are three-dimensional pixels, so we can accurately see inside the human body, as can be seen in the illustration, and we can see the 3D structures. Only through creative medical imaging methods, piggybacking off of physics ideas, can one actually take internal measurements of this three-dimensional voxel grid. So obviously, MRI is going to be based off of the concept of magnetic resonance, which we previously talked about. And MRI is specifically based off of magnetic resonance of proton or hydrogen spins, which is quite abundant in many substances. Now, what is the information that we're going to physically detect to build our image? Well, first, we're going to have to apply an external ambient uniform magnetic field through the imaging sample. And then we're going to excite all the protons in the imaging sample with photons or electromagnetic radiation at the Larmor frequency. After we shut off the excitation, the proton spins are going to continue oscillating at the Larmor frequency, releasing detectable photons or electromagnetic radiation again at the Larmor frequency, which is a signal which we can detect, just like how a radio transmitter receiver works. So the ultimate thing that we're measuring is going to be some sort of radio electromagnetic radiation signal, or a photon. Now, we don't want all our protons to be oscillating at the same Larmor frequency. That would not provide any useful information. Imagine if we told our piano tuner to tune all 88 keys to the same exact pitch of A440. That would not be a very useful piano since all the notes would sound the same. What should the piano tuner do instead? The piano tuner should tune all 88 keys to different frequencies so we can have interesting music. I may have perfect pitch, but even without perfect pitch, one can detect the relative differences of different keys on the piano because the human ear is designed to be able to distinguish lower pitched notes from higher pitched notes. So wouldn't it be nice if we could tune all our voxels to different pitches like the piano analogy? Indeed, we can change the tuning of our voxels by changing the magnetic field strength at each voxel. Remember from previous, the Larmor formula tells us the frequency of Larmor precession oscillation is proportional to B, the external magnetic field strength. So we can tune our voxel to whatever frequency we want by giving it the appropriate B field strength at that voxel's location. By ramping up the external magnetic field linearly, we can tune the Larmor frequencies linearly, kind of like a piano. So let's set up a three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system to keep track of what's going on. 
Assume the person is standing, then the plus z direction is pointing against gravity, the plus y direction is the way the person is facing, and the plus x direction is the direction of the person's right hand, as indicated in the diagram. We can divide up the entire 3D voxel grid into a giant stack of pizza boxes, with each pizza box being a horizontal slice of the 3D voxel grid as indicated in the diagram. In clinical practice, the resolution within a pizza box is much more fine and detailed than the resolution between pizza boxes. So Larmor precession is always going to be processing about the plus z axis, so our external ambient magnetic field is always going to point in the plus z direction. However, the magnitude of this magnetic field at a specific coordinate depends on where that coordinate is in three-dimensional space, and thus the magnitude of the magnetic field is going to vary through three-dimensional space. Indeed, if we ramp up the magnitude of the magnetic field linearly with a large slope in the plus z direction between the pizza boxes, and we slightly ramp up the magnitude of the magnetic field linearly with a small slope in the plus x direction, we can actually create a magnetic field arrangement such that we have a unique tuning for every voxel in terms of x-coordinate and z-coordinate, meaning the only voxels that have the same tuning are ones that have identical y-coordinates. We'll deal with this problem later. This can be seen in the illustrated diagram. Unfortunately, it is not physically easy to do to generate a magnetic field with a unique tuning for every voxel in terms of all three spatial dimensions, so we'll deal with the y dimension later. Notice how in between the pizza boxes, there is a big gap in terms of Larmor frequency, which would make sense since it was previously mentioned that between the pizza boxes don't have much resolution compared to the resolution inside within a pizza box. So the pizza boxes themselves are spaced much farther apart than the voxels within inside the pizza box. Now we can do something called slice selection. By picking a specific range of frequencies, one can pick a specific pizza box slice that corresponds to that general range of Larmor frequency tuning. Inside the pizza slice, we have even more specific fine-grained fine-tuning with a slightly linearly ramped field along the x direction. This is called frequency encoding. This situation can also be viewed using the following orchestra analogy. A tuba can play a wide range of very low notes, and a flute or piccolo can play a wide range of very high notes. Slice selection corresponds to assigning either the tuba or a piccolo to play a solo in the wind symphony, causing a sequence of either very low notes or high notes. The tuba has a general range of low frequencies associated with it, and the piccolo has a general range of high frequencies associated with it. Unfortunately, the tuba is so low and the piccolo is so high that they don't have any frequencies in common. Frequency encoding then corresponds to what specific fine-tuned notes the tuba or piccolo performer is playing during their solo. Indeed, the human ear is sensitive enough to detect what note and what octave the note being played is, and also distinguish which instrument is playing which particular note. This illustrates how slice selection and frequency encoding work. So let's just ignore the y direction for a moment and focus on getting some image in the x and z direction plane. We have an empty planar pixel grid in the x and z direction, and we want to fill it with intensity measurement values. How do we do this? Well, first thing to remember is each pixel does indeed have a unique resonant Larmor frequency by our previously explained intelligent engineering design of the ramped external magnetic field. That means with some sort of initial ex transient external excitement, and after that shuts off, each pixel will continue to resonate for a little while at their own unique Larmor frequency, which we can detect. Additionally, not only does each pixel have a different frequency of resonance, but each pixel also has a different amplitude of oscillation based off of physical material properties inside that particular voxel. All of this can be detected through physical measurement. By picking out what amplitude corresponds to what frequency, we can construct the image in the XZ plane grid using measured intensities. Are we going to just excite one pixel at a time and take subsequent measurements one after another for each pixel individually one at a time? Of course not, we can't wait that long. The squirming patient is probably uncomfortably strapped down to the MRI machine. This is analogously exactly why frequency domain optical coherence tomography OCT is much more effective in clinical practice than time domain OCT. Wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow strike all the bells at once, so to say, and take all measurements for all pixels simultaneously, altogether? Indeed, we can strike all the bells at once, so to say, simultaneously, to take all pixel measurements together using the Fourier transform. 
The piano is a polyphonic instrument rather than a monophonic instrument, so a pianist can play multiple notes together simultaneously at once, and the human ear can detect those simultaneously played notes as chords, like a C major chord, F sharp minor chord, etc. In an F sharp minor chord, the ear can detect that there is an F sharp, the root of the triad, simultaneously played with an A natural, the mediant of the triad, simultaneously played with a C sharp, the dominant of the triad, three notes together at once. If one has perfect pitch or has studied music theory, one will get particularly adept at detecting these individual notes and their musical relationships, even when the notes are played simultaneously together and not subsequently. Additionally, the human ear can also detect the amplitude of individual notes within a chord. Imagine if you're listening to a violin concerto, and the entire orchestra is way too loud that it drowns out the soloist such that you can't hear the soloist clearly anymore. Or imagine there's a piercing solo cadenza when the orchestra remains silent as the violinist plays away. In piano performance technique, it is desirable to emphasize the melody line usually carried in the right hand rather than making the accompaniment harmony line usually carried by the left hand comparatively too loud such that it drowns out the melody. So balance is good. If the human ear, and especially musicians, can detect these amplitude and frequency changes with many notes playing simultaneously, it would be a safe assumption to say that state-of-the-art technology can also detect these changes and make these measurements accurately as well. This intuitively illustrates what a linear system is, so even if one is unfamiliar with signals and systems theory and the Fourier transform, one can still understand the big picture of MRI. A multitude of oscillating frequencies of various amplitudes is just a linear combination of sinusoids from Fourier series, which can be easily detected the same way a radio antenna is able to pick up music and frequencies from different stations. So at the end of the day, by just striking all the bells at once, so to say, and exciting all the pixels in the XZ plane simultaneously together, taking the inverse Fourier transform of the emitted echo radio signal from all the protons in different voxels undergoing Larmor precession at various frequencies and amplitudes, one will have extracted all the relevant information and data for the measurements needed to fill out the image intensity values in the XZ planar grid. Throughout all three-dimensional space, each voxel has some magnetic field vector with some magnitude pointing in the z direction. Now before we move on to what we do about acquiring image data in the y direction, here's an important question to ask. How do we create a linearly ramped in magnitude z oriented magnetic field? The answer comes from electromagnetism. If we want to create a linear gradient ramp in the z direction, we can use a pair of inverse Helmholtz coils as shown in the diagram above. Now let's go through the derivation of this result. First, we quickly derive the formula for the strength of the magnetic field on axis of a current loop using the Biot Savart law. Obviously, the magnetic field always points in the normal direction perpendicular to the loop area due to symmetry. Notice how the strength of this magnetic field depends on only distance from the loop, and the relationship ends up being of the form of a Lorentzian slash Cauchy distribution taken to the 3 halfs power. Considering the other loop has current going in the opposite direction, the magnetic field will be in the negative slash opposite direction. When we put the two opposing inverse Helmholtz coils together, the total magnetic field will be the superposition of the magnetic field contributions from each of the individual loops. As can be seen from the graph of the superposition, the region in between the loops has close to a linear gradient in the z direction in terms of magnetic field. We did have to make an important approximation though. The person must be relatively thin compared to the radius of the coil, so that way all the voxels of interest lie near the central axis of the coil loops. This is a reasonable assumption. You've seen how big those MRI machines are. As can be seen from the magnetic field line diagram, the farther away from the axis one gets and the more off-center one goes, the more the magnetic field lines start to quote-unquote veer off course and become curved. This makes sense because if we are right next to the wire of the loop, the wire looks approximately linearly locally, and we should have circular magnetic field lines as expected from Ampere's law. Now, if we want to create a linear gradient ramp in the X or Y direction, we use Golay coils as drawn above. Intuitively, this should make an X or Y gradient. Let's ignore all irrelevant parts of the coil that are far away from or perpendicular to the region of interest and focus on the coils immediately in the vicinity of the patient. Once again, we assume the patient is relatively thin or skinny compared to the radius of the coil, so the patient is relatively centralized and localized near the center of the central axis of the coils. I suppose this explains exactly why MRI machines tend to be cylindrically shaped 
for the patient lying down horizontally to be put inside the cylinder. Now why does this configuration create a ramped magnetic field in the y direction? Let's think about it and look at just one coil at a time using the viet savart law. When we look directly on the central axis of the loop, notice that by geometric symmetry, the biot savart law calculation will end up being very similar to what we did for the inverse Helmholtz coil previously. The net sum total magnetic field at any point on the z-axis will be zero because the contributions from the top half and bottom half are balanced to be equal and opposite in all directions, which means the magnetic field from this configuration all cancels out to be zero in every direction for any point on the z-central axis. Let's assume the patient is very thin compared to the large radius of the loop, so we're only concerned with looking at points near the central axis of the loop. What happens if we slowly start to move up the x-axis away from the central axis? We'll notice how R1 becomes smaller or shorter than R2, and intuitively we end up being closer to the top half of the coil than the bottom half of the coil. Since distance is included in the biot savart law calculation, that means the magnetic field contribution from the closer upper top half of the coil will be comparatively stronger and more than the magnetic field contribution from the farther lower bottom half of the coil, causing an imbalance. Now the magnetic field will no longer all cancel out to be zero due to this imbalance, and there will be a net magnetic field force in the z direction at this point of the central axis and in the x direction but is small compared to the z direction component. Intuitively at the red point of interest slightly off axis versus the blue point on the central axis, why is there a stronger bz component than a bx component? Well remember, by looking at a coil slash loop of current, it is only near the wire itself do the magnetic field lines really veer off course from the orientation of the central axis slash normal to the loop surface area as indicated in the diagram. And even though the current is reversed in direction for half the loop on a Golay coil, in just looking at the xy plane and ignoring the magnetic field in the z direction, it doesn't actually matter which way the current is going because the symmetry remains the same, and the magnetic field always balances out in the xy plane. Not only is there no magnetic field pointing in the xy plane, but it is also worth noting that moving along the y axis does not change the relative balance between the contributions of the lower half of the loop and the upper half of the loop, so there is no magnetic field magnitude gradient in the y direction. In other words, points with the same y coordinate have the same magnetic field strength value, which is always pointing in the z direction, as illustrated by the diagram. So considering there is no magnetic field at the blue point central z axis point, and a bit of magnetic field BZ in the Z direction at the red off-axis point, by symmetry we could argue the same thing at the green point below the blue point as well, but in the opposite direction, as shown in the diagram. If we accurately fit a linear Taylor polynomial to approximate this function of magnetic field strength based off of position on the x-axis, that linearly maps negative x to negative b, 0x to 0b, and positive x to positive b, we should see a gradient field strength linear line relationship based off of position, accurately creating the desired magnetic field gradient. Now why are there two Golay coils? This is because we don't want the magnetic field to vary when moving along the z direction. Remember the biot savart law decays with distance. With just one Golay coil, if we move along the z direction we get farther and farther away from the one coil, which is not good. In between two Golay coils, the farther away we get from one coil, the closer we get to the other, which creates a more stable, flat, and unchanging magnetic field with respect to the z-coordinate direction. This can be seen by looking at the center of two equal sine Lorentzians to the three-halfs power, as indicated by the plot diagram. Alternatively, considering the biot savart law indicates that current element contributions to magnetic field decay with distance squared, if we look right in the center between two functions that decay with distance squared, it looks pretty flat, as indicated by the plot diagram. So that is exactly how you create gradient magnetic fields in any direction. And of course, the magnetic field always points in the z direction with varying magnitude throughout space either by using Golay coils or using inverse Helmholtz coils, depending on whether the gradient is in the same direction as the magnetic field or transverse or perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field in the z direction. Now notice how hard it is to calculate the magnetic field strength values off-axis for such simple configurations of inverse Helmholtz coils or Golay coils. This is why the field of computational electromagnetism exists and when numerical methods come in handy.
Numerical methods using graphics can also help one to visualize the physical situation. So back to the process of obtaining three-dimensional medical images. We've already established that through slice selection, we can select a general range of frequencies to encode a particular z-coordinate value, which is a particular pizza box horizontal slice of the entire voxel grid. Once we've selected a particular slice, we can use frequency encoding to encode all of the x-coordinates within the pizza box with different fine tunings of resonant frequency. But what do we do about acquiring information about the y dimension? We have to do something called phase encoding. So phase encoding is the tricky part of the MRI procedure. From part three previously, we already have an intuitive understanding of what phase is from the description of the T2 relaxation time. So the first question is, how do we change the relative phases of different protons that are undergoing Larmor precession? Well, some of the protons need to either speed up or slow down for a short amount of time compared to the others, which will cause a relative phase difference based off of how much it was sped up or slowed down by and how much time this occurred for. We can see the relative phase develop as follows in this short animation. At first, two different spins oscillate and undergo Larmor precession in sync at the same Larmor frequency. If we temporarily speed up or slow down one of the spins relatively compared to the other for a short period of time, a phase difference between the two different spins will start to develop. And how do we speed up or slow down some voxels more than other voxels? We're going to have to temporarily apply a gradient field of a specific slope and strength for a short amount of time based off of how much phase shift we want and where. Notice how if we apply a temporary gradient field, we will change or shift all the phases linearly along the direction of the gradient. Notice how if we fix a gradient magnetic field linear slope, our Larmor precession phase shift values will vary linearly along the spatial direction of the gradient with a slope that is just the amount of time we temporarily applied this gradient field. This is the key physical principle behind phase encoding. Considering we want to perform phase encoding along the dimension of the y direction, we want our temporary gradient field to be along the y direction. So let's think about how to use phase encoding to create an image. Once we've performed slice slope, so let's think about how to use phase encoding to create an image. Once we've performed slice selection in the z direction, we will only excite protons in this particular pizza box slice to undergo Larmor precession. All protons outside of this pizza box horizontal slice have a different resonant Larmor frequency and will not respond. So let's just focus on one particular pizza box slice at a time and what's going on within that slice. Now we have a two-dimensional grid in the XY plane to take intensity measurements for the voxels in the pizza box slice image. Now what happens if we excite all the frequencies of this particular pizza box? Well, all the pixels will undergo Larmor precession at a frequency depending on its x-coordinate, which is a problem since all the points with the same x-coordinate but different y-coordinates will ring at the same frequency. This is where we use phase encoding. So all these voxels or pixels in the pizza box slice of interest, ringing like bells, so to say, create a measurable radio wave electromagnetic radiation light signal which we can detect. What is the signal that we end up hearing? Well, it can be seen as a superposition or linear combination of all the ringing voxels simultaneously together at their respective frequencies based on their x-coordinate with their respective amplitudes from the voxel's material character. This can be written as such in the formula above, where i of x and y are the amplitudes slash magnitudes of each voxel as a ringing bell at their specific frequency, which is linearly based off of their x-coordinate from the x-magnetic field gradient for frequency encoding, which can be seen as the trigonometric sinusoid. By Euler's formula, let's replace the trigonometric sinusoid with an oscillating complex exponential. Now what happens when we temporarily turn on the y-gradient magnetic field for a short amount of time for tau seconds? Well, the phase shift value will be linear in the y-direction with slope of tau, so the new signal that we hear will now be the following where we shift the phase of each complex oscillating sinusoid and the linear combination sum by the corresponding amount linearly with slope tau based off of their spatial location in the y dimension. Now we can rearrange the complex exponentials as such, and we see this looks eerily similar to the definition of the Fourier transform, and indeed this is. What we are hearing and detecting at the end of the day is indeed by mathematical definition the two-dimensional Fourier transform of the image that we want, i of x and y. If we have the two-dimensional Fourier transform of our desired image, i of x and y, 
we can easily get the original image by just taking the inverse two-dimensional Fourier transform of our measured signal and what we heard from the ringing all the bells of the voxels. However, there is no free lunch. Notice how what we hear, R of t and tau, is a two-dimensional signal dependent on both time t and phase shift tau, so to say. Sound or radio signals are only one-dimensional based off of time, so it is impossible to simultaneously hear both dimensions at once, and we can only hear the time dimension with one phase value tau at a time. I mean intuitively, after all, how is it even possible to hear an image? Therefore, we're going to have to repeat the experiment multiple times for different tau values to get measurements for the y dimension. We need to repeat the experiment for multiple different phase shifts in order to have data along the y dimension to be able to perform a two-dimensional Fourier transform on. If we only perform the experiment once for just a single tau value, there is no way to deduce any information about the dimension along the y-axis, as can be directly seen in the mathematical formula. The two-dimensional Fourier transform requires integration or summation along two dimensions, and if one of those dimensions only has one row, that is hardly much information to work with to generate an image along that dimension. But that is okay, the MRI machine is very efficient at performing these sequential experiments for different tau values or phase shift parameters in succession, and clinically the patient doesn't have to be in the MRI machine for more than like an hour, especially since after that point the patient will become squirmy, affecting image quality results, and the amount of radiation will become a health hazard. And there we have it. At the end of the day, the MRI is able to make intensity measurements for voxels with coordinates in all three X, Y, Z spatial dimensions by using slice selection, frequency encoding, and phase encoding, and then taking the inverse 2D Fourier transform of the resulting raw measurements of the radio signal that the machine hears. It is also worth noting that there are different ways to take the intensity measurements, called T1 weighting, T2 weighting, and proton density weighting. Previously, we said that I of X and Y intensity values depended on physical material properties of the voxel. Depending on what we're looking for, in general, we want our image to have the most contrast as possible, meaning, for example, voxels corresponding to flesh look drastically different and have enormously different intensity measurements than voxels corresponding to bone. Bone and flesh are obviously different materials and will have different physical material properties, and it is up to the user to pick which material property to look at the most that tells one the most information about the distinction between bone and flesh. Indeed, various materials have different intrinsic proton densities, T1 times and T2 times, and we can generate images based off of these three properties or weighted into some linear combination of these that gives the best desired contrast. Since we established that though we hear a linear superposition combination of sinusoidal waves from each and every voxel, we can single out one at a time and detect each individual voxel signal and look at a single voxel by examining at its particular phase and frequency from slice selection, frequency encoding, each phase particular encoding. voxel has a unique phase and frequency. The T1 or T2 measurement for this particular voxel is the rate of exponential decay, which we can calculate or measure from inspection of the graph. Since we are allowed to look at one voxel at a time, how do we measure the three intensity properties of a voxel? Well, to measure proton density, it literally just corresponds to the amplitude of that particular voxel's sinusoidal signal. What if we want to measure T2 time of that particular voxel? Well, radio waves are just oscillating electromagnetic fields, which can be detected through a radio antenna or a detector coil whose surface area normal vector is oriented in the XY plane which will, from Faraday's law, undergo a time-changing flux from the oscillating electromagnetic wave. T2 time corresponds to exponential decay in the xy plane direction, which is why we must orient our detector in this direction. This oscillating electromagnetic wave's amplitude will decay exponentially with respect to the T2 time of the particular voxel, which we just measure on, like in an oscilloscope, by looking at how the signal decays. Likewise, what if we want to measure T1 time of that particular voxel? Well, T1 time corresponds to a magnetic field exponentially decaying in the Z direction, so this time we put the detector radio antenna or a coil oriented in such a way that its surface area normal points in the Z direction, which will, from Faraday's law, undergo a time-changing flux from the changing magnetic field in the Z direction. The derivative of exponential decay in the Z direction is still just exponential decay in the Z direction, so thus we do have a time-changing magnetic field in the Z direction to create a time-changing magnetic flux, 
We can measure the signal from this exponentially decaying magnetic field in the z direction, which will also be an exponentially decaying signal. And by looking at how fast the signal decays, we can deduce the t1 time of this particular voxel. Using different weighting schemes, one can pick which measurement scheme will provide the most clear images for whatever medical or scientific purposes. Unfortunately, NMR spectra acquisition, which we previously talked about, has no other options other than proton density, so to say. So chemists are out of luck. So here we have it. This is the entire story of the science, engineering, and mathematics of how MRI image acquisition works. It certainly is a very interdisciplinary field, as can be seen from the sheer breadth of all the various topics covered. It is worth mentioning that there is a whole world out there. There is also an entire field of MRI image analysis using techniques from computer vision and computer graphics, and there is also the whole field of radiology where physicians in the field of medicine work with visually analyzing MRI image data for clinical purposes. Furthermore, multidimensional Fourier transforms are extremely useful for computed tomography CT images and CAT scans, computer vision and graphics, optical coherence tomography OCT, and X-ray crystallography. In conclusion, I would like to say the entire field of STEM, science, math, and engineering is more related than one might expect, and there are numerous surprising and illuminating connections between various seemingly disparate fields just about everywhere, as long as one is open to the adventure of the search and the learning process. This video series touched upon a plethora of various fields, and hopefully it shed some light on these particularly fascinating and interdisciplinary topics and the connections between them, and hopefully this can inspire people to see the beauty of math and science. Thank you for watching.